Okay, Hare Krishna, everyone. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Okay, so welcome to our uh, Bhakti Shastri. We're studying Bhagavad Gita. Recording in progress. We're studying Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7 to chapter 12. So I'll be taking your class here for the next two weeks. We're having class five days a week, Monday to Friday, this time. Uh, okay. Oma jnana timarandasya jnana shalakaya chaksur militanyena tasmai shri gurave namaha vanchakaupatarubhyascha kripa sindhu bhayevacha patitanam pavanebhyo vaishnavibhyo namo namaha jai shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda shri atvaita gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare Alright, so here's the title, Pure Devotional Service, Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 7 to 12. Uh, is everyone seeing the slideshow okay? Yes Maharaj. Yes Maharaj. Okay, good. Okay, so Bhagavad Gita is in three portions. You've already studied the first six chapters, I assume. So the first six chapters was emphasizing more karma yoga. Although other yogas were also introduced, you had some jnana yoga, you had dhyana yoga, and there's a tinge of bhakti there also, but the main feature is on karma yoga. So that was the first six chapters. And then this middle portion is more on bhakti yoga. Other things are also there, but the emphasis is more towards bhakti. And then in the final section, it will be jnana yoga. Like that, three portions. So bhakti is in the middle. Bhakti is in the middle. Now some people think the most important yoga should come at the end. Some people think, you know, the, the, you know like they have a saying, you, you, there should be a sweet at the end. And so, no, Bhagavad Gita is not like that. Bhagavad Gita is more like a sandwich. And, and with a sandwich, you have bread on the outside and the good thing in the middle. At least I, I hope you have a nice sandwich, you know, you, we want to put the, maybe the cheese or something there in the middle. And so bhakti yoga is like that. And bhakti yoga is in the center and it's protected, the two coverings of bhakti yoga. In the beginning by karma yoga and at the end by jnana yoga. So bhakti yoga is the main focus of the Bhagavad Gita and it's kept in the central position there, although it also comes there in other places. All right, so we'll go ahead. Chapter summary, summary of the chapter. This seventh chapter describes the power of the Lord, most worthy of worship, and the four types of worshiper and non-worshippers. So we'll hear about these things. Why Krishna is most worthy of worship, and the four types of worshippers, four kinds of people, pious people who come to Krishna, and those people who don't come to Krishna, it will all be described in the seventh chapter. Conclusion of the first six chapters. Some people only read the first six chapters. Just the other day I was talking with one lady and she was telling me, she, she said she'd only read the first six chapters and she'd never studied the central portion of the Bhagavad Gita. She'd only knew the first six chapters and some people even think the Bhagavad Gita is only six chapters. There was one famous Acharya 
and he left the world now, but uh, he was a famous uh, swap, a famous guru, a Maharishi, and uh, he he wrote a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, but only the first six chapters. He didn't write any more than the first six chapters. So many people thought Bhagavad Gita is only six chapters. But Bhagavad, first six chapters, only the first part of the Bhagavad Gita. You have to go on and hear the rest of the Bhagavad Gita. So Bhagavad Gita, the first six chapters was the beginning of hearing the Yoga Lata. Describe, we've taken this reference here from Prabhupada's purport, from chapter 7, text number 1. Maybe someone would like to read this for me. In the, first six, in the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, the living entity has been described as a non-material spirit soul capable of elevating himself to self-realization by different types of yogas. At the end of the sixth chapter, it, it has been clearly stated that the steady concentration of the mind upon Krishna, or in other words, Krishna consciousness, is the highest form of all yoga. By concentrating one's mind upon Krishna, one is able to know the absolute truth completely, but not otherwise. Thank you. Bhagavad Gita Sloka. Thank you, Prabhu, yes. So, the first six chapters was describing, uh, of course, you know, in the second chapter, you heard the difference between the body and the soul. And Lord Krishna was defeating all of Arjuna's re arguments for not wanting to fight. And then Lord Krishna brought the discussion to a higher level, speaking about karma yoga and how we didn't have to worry about reactions, and then brought in jnana, and then even taught meditation in the sixth chapter. Constant, and then at the end of the sixth chapter, Lord Krishna concluded his description of the yoga ladder by describing that bhakti yoga was at the top of the yoga ladder, that it was a, the supreme method of yoga. And all the other yogas, the other processes are all included within bhakti yoga. And so it's bhakti yoga, which yogi uh, yoginam api sarvesham margatin antaratmanam, right? It's the highest yoga, the topmost yoga. But we have to concentrate the mind upon Krishna. It's not so easy thing to actually come to that level of bhakti yoga. We talk about it, but to actually do it properly, in other words, concentrating our mind upon Krishna is often the challenge. So, Lord Krishna described these things in the first six chapters. Now in the seventh chapter, he's going to go on and he begins the seventh chapter by again stressing the importance of fixing the mind, controlling the mind. Because without controlling the mind, then we can never actually be thinking of Krishna and remembering Krishna. Alright, so here's the outline of the seventh chapter. Chapter begins with the first three verses, knowing Krishna in full by hearing about him. We will hear about the importance of this hearing process. Certainly, uh, Lord Chaitanya always gave great importance to the hearing process. And we see here also in the seventh chapter, Lord Krishna is stressing hearing. Actually, it's significant because hearing is the first step of bhakti yoga, right? Without hearing, we're not able to chant. Srinvatam Svakata Krishna. So hearing, Srinvatam Svakata Krishna Punya Svaravana Kirtana. Oh, oh uh, that's another verse. I'm, I'm thinking of something else. Shravanam Kirtan Vishnu, Smaranam Pada Sevanam, Archanam Vandam Dashyam Sakyan Atmani Vedanam. So Shravanam Kirtan Vishnu. The first thing is hearing. 
we have to hear and then we can chant and then we can remember so bhakti yoga is progressive and the first step of bhakti yoga is hearing so the seventh chapter also begins with lord krishna speaking about the importance of hearing and then verses 4 up to number 12 krishna will describe himself as the origin and essence of everything both spiritual and material and that is followed by of text 13 and 14 lord krishna controls the modes therefore surrender then 15 to 19 we'll hear the four kinds of impious and pious persons and who are the best of these and then 20 to 25 misplaced surrender demigod worshippers and impersonalists are described and then the final section the bewilderment of the living entity and his freedom through knowledge of krishna bewildered right so that's the different sections of the Bhagavad Gita you can see here we've broken the chapter into these different subheadings and we'll look at these points as we go through this seventh chapter seventh chapter we'll look at today and tomorrow also it's an, a, an important chapter so we'll spend a couple of days we have we have only six chapters and but we have 10 classes, so we can spend a couple of days on the seventh chapter. All right, someone like to read connection with previous chapter? In the last, In the verse, last of Krishna, verse of chapter, Krishna explained that he who always abides in me, concentrates the mind upon me and renders loving devotional service to me is the greatest of all yogis. In order to explain his own swarup, the object of worship by the jiva and the means to realize him, he speaks chapter 7. Hare Krishna. Okay. Thank you, Maharaji. Oh, yeah. So, Lord Krishna, in the previous chapter, he'd spoken about devotional service and concentrating the mind. It's the highest. Yogi nama pisavisham madgatein antaratmanam. Same yuta tamo mata, the highest yogi, the best yogi. And so Lord Krishna wants to explain this. How to worship. The object of worship by the jiva, the means to realize him. We're going to hear the means to how to realize Krishna and why Krishna is the object of worship. So here's the first verse of the seventh chapter. Mm. Right? Someone like to chant for us? Who is good in chanting? Who likes to chant? Yeah, go ahead. Shri Bhagavan Vacha. Maya Sakta Mana Partha Yogam Yunjam Madashaya Asam Shayam Samadramam Yathagyasasi Tachino. Yes, translation. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, Now hear, O Arjuna, how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me, with your mind attached to me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. All right. So Lord Krishna is speaking, Maya Asaktamana, with your mind attached to me. We want to attach our minds to Krishna. It's very important, all right? Devotional service. We want to be constantly thinking of Krishna. Always remember Krishna, never forget him. So it's important for us to attach our minds to Krishna. In this way, we will be able to be free from doubt. But we have to, in order to attach our minds to fully to Krishna, we have to hear. 
And so Krishna begins. He, you can see the Lord said, Now hear, O Arjuna. And so that's Jatajasna si tachrinu, tachrinu. Important. Prabhupada said this is the importance of hearing. Hear, Arjuna. Hearing is important because without hearing, there will be the tendency just simply to speculate and we enjoy the mind. Instead of hearing what is actual the truth and what is the reality of things, we speculate on it with our mind. And we're thinking, well, I think like this, in my opinion, I'm thinking, I understand it in this way. That's useless. That is not Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness is not speculation. Krishna consciousness is hearing. We have to hear from Krishna and from Krishna's representative. We could say Arjuna was very fortunate <coughs> because Lord Krishna was there directly speaking to him. We, are, have, we hear from Krishna's representative, just like Srila Prabhupada, he is a representative of Lord Krishna. So we should hear from Prabhupada, we shouldn't have any doubts, just hear carefully. Right? Someone read? Knowing Krishna in full by hearing about him. Different types of yoga are only stepping stones on the path of Krishna Consciousness. One who takes directly to Krishna Consciousness automatically knows about Brahm Jyoti and Paramatma in full. This of Krishna Consciousness Yoga, one can know everything in full, namely the absolute truth, the living entities, the material nature and their manifestations with paraphernalia. Yeah, a bit more. Wait. Yeah, go ahead. One to therefore begin yoga practice as directed in the last verse of the sixth chapter. Concentration of the mind upon Krishna, the Supreme, the Supreme is made possible by scribed devotional service in nine different forms, of which Shravanam is the first and the most important. The Lord therefore says to Arjuna, touch you or hear from me. One has therefore to learn from Krishna directly or from a pure devotee of Krishna and not from a non-devotee upstart, popped up with a academic qualification, uh, academic education. Bhagavad Gita Okay, thank you, Mariji. Uh, well, let's have a look at this, what Prabhupada is saying here. It's a, different types of yoga are just stepping stones for Krishna consciousness. But we, we want to, we're taking directly to Krishna Consciousness. The other yogas, you know, Hatha Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, they're, they're going to lead us to Krishna Consciousness. They will lead us to Bhakti Yoga. But why, why go through that? Go directly to Bhakti Yoga. And, and Prabhupada said, you, you come to Krishna Consciousness, We'll know everything about the other things like Brahma, the Brahman and Paramatma. It's all there within Bhakti Yoga. And just like by reading Srimad Bhagavatam, we get information about the Brahman and Paramatma. Everything is there in the scriptures. We hear about Krishna, Krishna's teaching, Krishna's describing everything to us. Prabhupada gives the example, one who has a hundred dollars, he also has fifty dollars, he also has twenty dollars. It's all included within the one hundred dollars. In the same way, one who is a bhakti yogi, he also has knowledge of the Brahman and knowledge of Paramatma. But he understands ultimately the supreme goal, the supreme object of meditation is the Bhagavan feature, the absolute truth. So devotees not bewildered about these things. And then in the second section here, Prabhupada is emphasizing the importance concentrating the mind by 
hearing. It's the most effective means of concentrating the mind. Some people, they will do silent meditation. They want to go, they, want, they think silent meditation, they go away from everyone, they don't want to hear anything. But the best thing is to hear about Krishna. Fill the ears with topics of Krishna. The, there's a famous example of the monkeys. The monkeys, one monkey's covering his ears. Hear no evil. And then covers his mouth. Speak no evil. Covers his eyes. See no evil. But devotees, we don't have to do that. We just simply have to put Krishna there. And then we, we don't have to be afraid of anything. Hear no evil. We'll just hear about Krishna. There's no evil in hearing about Krishna. So we hear from Krishna or from Krishna's representative, the pure devotee. You don't want to hear from someone who is not a devotee. And of course there are a lot of people who are speaking on Bhagavad Gita, but often they're not, they, 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 they simply have academic qualifications and no real devotion. So it's important that Krishna is understood by devotion. Okay, here's another quote. This is from Srimad Bhagavatam. Someone read? Knowing Krishna in full by hearing about him. The whole world is full of sinful life. So we are creating the atmosphere Punya Shravana, chanting and hearing. Simply by these two processes, Punya Shravana Kirtana, Punya Payas. So anyone who is coming here, even he does not understand a single word which we are speaking. If he simply hears, he becomes pious. Simply by hearing, even a child, he becomes pious. And unless we are free from our sinful life, we cannot understand about God. Srimad Bhagavatam 1.2.17, Los Angeles, August 20, 1972. Thank you, Manaji, yes. Prabhupada's point, uh, very relevant. In order to actually fully take up devotional service, we have to be freed of sinful reactions. This is a point which comes out later in the Bhagavad Gita. Right? People who have acted piously in previous lives and in this life, and who are freed from the reactions of sins, then they can engage themselves in my service with determination. So here Prabhupada quotes Srimad Bhagavatam, Punya Shravana Kirtana. Hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam is itself a pious activity. So it creates piety in people if they would simply be willing to hear. And Prabhupada said even a, even a child, how much the child can actually understand. But because he's hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, he'll be benefited. Probably I, I won't say it today. Yeah. All right, this is another quote from Prabhupada about hearing. Someone read. Knowing Krishna in full by hearing about him. This is practical because by hearing about Krishna, one becomes automatically attached to the Supreme Spirit. This attachment is called Paris Anubhuti spiritual satisfaction. It is just like the feeling of satisfaction a hungry man has for every morsel of food he eats. The more one eats while hungry, the more one feels satisfaction and strength. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, there's a verse like that in Srimad Bhagavatam describing like that. The, the, the spiritual advancement is compared to the hungry man eating food. So the hungry man eats food, he feels relief from hunger, and not only does he feel relief from hunger, he feels also strength and nourishment and satisfaction. And similarly, when a devotee practices Krishna consciousness, hearing about Krishna, he will feel also spiritual satisfaction. 
he will feel, he will, he will awaken realization of the Lord and detachment from the material. So this all comes about step by step. So it's a very relevant example. We all know what hunger is like, and we all know, you know, if, if you when you're fasting, maybe after you break the fast, you feel relief from hunger, and you feel strength and then satisfaction. So that th the same thing comes about by hearing about Krishna. We develop spiritual satisfaction. Okay, another quote. This Bhagavad Gita. Someone read. Similarly, by discharge or devotional service, one feels transcendental satisfaction as the mind becomes detached from material objective. It is something like curing a disease by expert treatment and appropriate diet. Hearing of the transcendental activities of Lord Krishna is therefore expert treatment for the mad mind. And eating the foodstuff offered to Krishna is the appropriate diet for the suffering patient. This treatment is the process of Krishna Consciousness, BG 635. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we often give this example. Uh, chanting is like the, the medicine. Oh no, prasadam is the medicine, chanting. Uh, how does it we go? Uh, curing a disease by expert treatment and appropriate diet. So expert treatment, the medicine and the appropriate diet. And so the, the medicine is like that, the chanting, expert treatment, and the diet, prasadam. So hearing about Krishna, this is also part of that treatment. Or maybe you could say hearing the mantra is one thing, but hearing also the glories of Krishna and hearing the teachings of Lord Krishna is given here in Bhagavad Gita. Another quote here from Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto. Yes, someone read. One should hear with that attention. Sorry, Mataji, you go, please. One should hear with rapt attention from the real person. And then he can at once realize the presence of Lord Krishna in every page. The secret of knowing Bhagavatam is mentioned here. No one can give rapt attention who is not pure in mind. No one can be pure in mind who is not pure in action. No one can be pure in action who is not pure in eating, sleeping, pairing and mating. But somehow or other, if someone hears with rapt attention from the right person, at the very beginning, one can assuredly see Lord Krishna in person in the pages of Bhagavad Gita. All right, so it's a very nice purport. It's a very famous purport. I hope you're familiar with it. It comes, it's the final verse of the third chapter of the first canto. Lord Krishna had been describing the different Leela avatars. And then at the end of the chapter, uh, they were discussing the glories of Srimad Bhagavatam. And then how to actually concentrate the mind, how to fix the mind on hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. So, this is Prabhupada's purport to that section, that we have to hear with rapt attention from the right person also. And then Prabhupada said, if we read, if we hear in this way, one day we will see Krishna in every page. You want to see Krishna? You can see Krishna in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam or even Bhagavad Gita, if we study in the proper manner, with the right mood, with that rapt attention. And Prabhupada gives some points here, you, we should, in order to control the mind, you must be pure in action. And pure in action means pure in eating, sleeping, fearing and mating. But then at the end he seems to give a concession, he says, somehow or other, if someone hears with rapt attention from the right person at the very beginning, one can assuredly see Krishna. 
in the pages of Bhagavatam. We want to see Krishna? Read this book, read Srimad Bhagavatam. We can see Krishna there in the pages. But we have to read carefully. All right. A smaller quote here. Actually, the perfection of life depends on one's inclination to hear about Krishna. Unless one becomes interested in Krishna, in his pastimes and activities, there is no question of liberation by means of yoga practice or speculative knowledge. Srimad Bhagavatam 4, 23.12, purport. So, Again, hearing about Krishna, Prabhupada's making the point here, don't get into speculation. And it's not a question of yoga practice. We have to simply want to be hearing about Krishna. We should be very eager and very interested to hear about Krishna. So, that's the first verse. The second verse then goes on. Does someone like to read second verse for us? <laughs> yes, you know the translation? Yes, Maharaj. I shall not declare unto you in full this knowledge, both phenomenal and uh, luminous. This being known, nothing further shall remain for you to know. Okay, nothing further will remain for you to know. You know everything. So mention jnanam and vijnanam, knowledge and realization, or everything which is phenomenal and numinous. Jnanam and vijnanam. Jnanam, knowledge, and Vigyanam is sometimes described as realization. So that is coming. Here's some quotes here from Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur in relation to this. He said, Before attaining the stage of attachment to me, the devotee understands Jnanam, my opulence. After that, he realizes Vigyanam, my sweetness. So Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur speaking on behalf of Lord Krishna. Before attaining the stage of attachment to Krishna, the devotee first of all understands, gets some knowledge of Krishna's opulence, and then he goes on to realize Krishna's sweetness. And Baladeva Vijabhusan, in regard to this, he has a little different. He says, Jnanam refers to knowledge about Krishna's spiritual and material energies. We'll be looking at that in a minute, about Krishna's spiritual and material energy. And Vigyanam refers to his transcendental form apart from these energies. In other words, Krishna's eternal form and pastimes are not related to the material creation. Hmm. Krishna has his own place in the spiritual world. He's not related to the material creation. Srila Prabhupada says, complete knowledge includes knowledge of the phenomenal world, the spirit behind it, and the source of both of them. When the cause of all causes becomes known, then everything noble becomes known, and nothing remains unknown. The sweetness, this big jnanam, the realizing the sweetness of the Lord. Certainly, it's not very common, it's rare. And that's how this verse follows. After speaking in that way about knowing everything, realizing that sweetness being rare, Lord Krishna speaks this verse. Someone read? Anushyanam sahasreshu kashyapyat 
सिद्धे यथातम अपि सिद्धा नाम कश्चिम वेति तत्वता translation out of thousand amongst men one may endeavor for perfection and of those who attain perfection hardly one knows me in truth mm-hmm. yeah it's not in other words it's rare people actually know the sweetness of krishna so here's a little exercise for you Vaishnava, and how many people do we have in the gr- class tonight? Uh, 20, Maharaj. 20, all right. So, can we have pairs? Uh, okay, all right, Maharaj. I'll and, divide. Yeah, before you divide, we'll first of all, here's the question. We discuss, we want you to discuss with your partner. There is said, Bhakti is easy because it requires no material qualifications. But, in another sense, it's the most difficult process. So how could this statement be misunderstood in relation to the devotees of Krishna, and in particular to ISKCON devotees? Mm -hmm. Everyone got the question? Yeah, so, we'll give you some, what, five minutes? Five minutes to talk about this, see how you get on, five minutes? So, so how, do, how do we do it in a pair, um, outside this call, is it, Arati? The devotee will put yeah. you, give you a partner, the devotee, there should be somebody uh, putting people into pairs and they'll put you we go into rooms right you have rooms we have outside yeah we go outside. Hmm. break yeah, okay. break out hmm. rooms and you'll be with a partner and you can discuss so shall i open uh, no, Maharaj? Hare Krishna, Maharaj. yes uh Maharaj, i did not understand uh, i could not understand this question very well um, how may the statement be misunderstood? Yes, how may, how may it be misunderstood? In other words, we may, you know, we put the wrong meaning into this question, into this point, this statement. We, we, we don't understand it properly. And we, we take some other meaning from it in relation to the devotees of Krishna. Devotees of Krishna, we, we say, oh, bhakti is easy because it requires no material qualifications. But it's the most difficult process. So, is it easy or is it not? So we may say, well, well, it's easy, but at the same time it's not, you know. <laughs> So we may misunderstand it. It's easy for some people. It's not easy for other people. What is this? What's this? What is this? What? How should we take this statement? This is this Vaishnava integrity. Let's see. Well, there's a. The, it's described here. Oh no. The idea is to understand the 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 quest the, the the statement and often we will put the meaning we want to go into the statement rather than the meaning which is actually intended by the author so how is it how should we actually understand how do you understand this statement in relation to devotees of krishna How can we under how how what are the different ways in which this statement could be understood? And what is the correct way to understand it? Mm. Bhakti is easy. Yes, we know it's easy to hold the beads and to chant Hare Krishna. 
But it's the most difficult, no, it's very difficult to get people to chant properly, to chant without offense, to fix their mind on the holy name. It's not so easy. So we may consider, should we, should we, uh, devotees of Krishna, devotees of Krishna, they have the easiest process. It's a very easy thing to be a devotee of Krishna. We may take the first part of the statement. Oh, yeah, anybody can be a devotee of Krishna. It's easy. No material qualifications. You don't have to have any qualifications to be a devotee of Krishna. So if you don't have to have any material qualifications, it's not, we shouldn't value it very much. We don't need to value it very much because, you know, you don't have to have any qualifications, so it can be very important. We may put so many different understandings into these kind of statements. But in another sense, it's the most difficult process. Oh, it's so difficult. Oh, then nobody can do it. Then why should I bother trying? It's so difficult. I don't want, you know, I don't want to do something that's so difficult. I shouldn't, I shouldn't waste my time trying. And then, in particular, to ISKCON devotees. Well, ISKCON devotees, how do we differ from devotees of Krishna? <laughs> Is there a difference between ISKCON devotees and devotees of Krishna? Of course, devotees of ISKCON are also Krishna devotees, but there are devotees of Krishna who are not members of ISKCON. So what is the particular thing, what things are particular to ISKCON devotees? So take some time, take a few minutes and discuss with your partners and see what you can come up with on your own and we'll come back, right? Give you five minutes to talk about this with your partner and see if you can come up with some ideas. Shall I open it now, Maharaj? Yes, please. Hare Krishna, Param Karuna, Madhav Prabhu, please join the room.
Alright, I think time's up, Prabhu. Okay, Maharaj, I'll close the rooms now, so it will get closed by one minute. Yes. It'll take... So all are back. Uh, all right. Form and not the uh, substance. We forget the what is the substance of doing that thing. Like Correct, uh, Madhuji. The breakout room has been finished. We are back. All right. Everyone's back. Oh. Hare Krishna, what happened? Maharaj, you have started a room, Maharaj. How did I get in the room, my goodness? <laughs> <laughs> Recording in progress. Okay, I'm back in the main session, right? <laughs> I had a quick journey into one one room. All right, let's... I, I had someone in my group, Maharajji, but I couldn't hear him because his audio was not working. So oh. Oh, my I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't discuss anything, but I'll mention what I feel. All, all right, do you have some thoughts on it? Would you like to share with us? Yeah, so, I mean, these, this is something that I've thought about that you know, when we say that bhakti is easy because it doesn't require any material qualification is okay. But when we talk about the process where it says that you have to have your mind fixed on Krishna, right? With him being the center and we are engaged in worshipping him with transcendental faith. Now this process of bhakti is tough, especially when people are entangled in material world, uh, so it becomes very difficult. And I feel that while it's easy to say that bhakti doesn't require a qualification, but to fix ourselves on Krishna in mind and in faith is a difficult process. And I was relating it back to the eight step process or a nine step process from Shraddha to Prema. Now that's where it is a process that we we have to follow to reach the point of bhakti. So it's not something that on the very first day you are able to kind of do bhakti in a pure way. And that's what I feel is a, is a difficult process. Now, please tell me if I'm, I'm going in the right direction or not. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't quite pick up on which point uh, where's the, the misunderstanding? Well, how would, how would, you know the... Oh, so, okay. So, so you might misunderstand it that, yes, I can become the bhakt on the very first day. So that it's an easy, uh, you know, like you don't need a qualification. So that's a misunderstanding right. because you do need, you do need to follow a process. Right. Uh, you know, so I think that is a misunderstanding. If I, I when I joined this con, you know, you know, it, it it is not easy. That's what I could feel in the first few days, that it is a whole process that I have to follow. Mm. Um, so it, it is a misunderstanding if someone feels that I could become a bhakt, pure bhakt on the very first day. Mm -hmm. It is a good vigyan process, you know, and when you say vigyan, it is a methodic, methodical process, according to me. 
it is not an easy thing on the first day and i could see the difference between say iskon devotee and normal devotees that we see in our day to day home that i am krishna bhakta or i pray to krishna every day but there is a difference right because because of the methodical process that you go through to get fixated on krishna and to fix your mind in krishna and faith in krishna yes thank you very much very nice now uh, actually uh, in madhurya kadambini vishwanath chakravarti thakur describes different anarthas which are there in devotional service and one of them is that there's a lot of enthusiasm due to pride in the beginning of devotional service because sometimes we think this is easy oh I, I, this is easy oh 16 rounds this is easy you know <laughs> in the beginning sometimes you know people come and we're thinking oh nothing very difficult here yeah you know i'm a pure devotee why not we're thinking so <laughs> not very challenging you know <laughs> Mm -hmm. Far from there. Yeah, mm -hmm. but as we go on, of course, we we see there are so many, so many paths, so many things to be understood, so many, uh, mm. so much progress is still to be made. Okay, so thank you very much, Mataji. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else would like to share with us? Yes, Prabhu. Uh, yes. Remind me, fine. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. One is like we hear that uh, these two things that uh, one is bhakti is like uh, and it's so easy and it's you know it's so such a good process that even if we walk with closed eyes we will never fall down. Even Rupa Goswami says in NOD that uh, there is no that one who is practicing all the rules and regulations in bhakti he will never fall down. And if there is a fall down, then that will be a circumstantial fall down. So in that sense, it's easy because we don't require any material qualification, especially we hear the verse 9.26, Patana Pushpam Phalam I mean, everyone can satisfy Krishna through simple means. So we don't require any material qualification. Uh, so in that sense, it's easy. But still, we also hear that uh, uh, Bhakti is like a sharp and razor. So in that sense, uh, even... Uh, but uh, to come to bhakti, although we don't require material qualification, we do need bhakti and muk sukriti. We need mercy of devotees. And after we come to bhakti, that time we have to be very sincere and we have to be very uh, careful that we don't break any regulated principle. We are following all the rules very strictly. And simultaneously, we should always be humble and we should know that we cannot go advance in bhakti without the mercy of devotees, without the bhakti of the spiritual master. So it's both the things. It's in one sense, it's a way, I mean, you can even walk with closed eyes and you'll never fall. But in the other sense, it's like a sharpened razor. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. So where's the misunderstanding? That one way we think you can walk with closed eyes, but, <laughs> but we should be careful because it's a sharpened razor. We can get cut easily. Okay. All right, thank you Prabhu for that. Yes, someone else has a hand up here. Can I say something, Maharaj? Please do. Uh, so, uh, we were discussing, Maharaj, I, you know, everybody is saying bhakti is easy, but when you're introduced to Krishna consciousness, you're told only these many rounds, only this to be done, only that. But when we actually come to the gravity of those rules, and you will actually try to understand, okay, these are important rules and regulations that we need to follow to, you know, to climb up the ladder of advancement in Krishna consciousness. We often tend to become lazy and we're like, sorry, can't do it. So that means I think is con devotees, you know, misunderstand that was okay, okay, since it's difficult, bhakti might be easy, but it's difficult at the same time. And it's difficult, we can't do it, so we let go of it sometimes. It's okay. Since it's difficult and we can't do it, let's not even try to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is one thing that we, you know, brought down as a conclusion, okay. At this sometimes it actually becomes difficult to pull yourself up and follow those rules and regulations and those instructions to the T and to the two dot the I's and cross the T's. <laughs> yeah, that's very nice. Yeah. Yeah, there are 
we, we, we may think, well, some things are just too difficult. We won't even try to do it, right? <laughs> so, yeah, people, it, 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 that is quite common, especially in ISKCON devotees, right? Because we do have all these rules and regulations, you know? If you're just an ordinary Krishna devotee, oh, I'm a devotee, you know. Do you chant? No, I don't chant. You know, I'm a devotee, though. I'm a devotee. <laughs> Iskon devotees, there's so many things you have to do, you know. So how much can we do as an Iskon devotee? <laughs> Very nice realization. Thank you, Manaji. Very nice. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Oh, um, we'll just take one more. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, yes, Maharaj, I would like to say that uh, uh, I would like to comment on chanting process, for example. Uh, chanting seems to be very easy, but it's not as easy as it seems to be. Uh, for spawn devotees, spawn devotees especially know it very well. Uh, chanting is done at uh, offenses stage, then without offenses stage. But we have to uh, cover a long path to come to the stage without offenses. So. If we compare Krishna devotees who are living outside Iskon to the Iskon devotees, then there is a huge difference. Iskon devotees have to, of course, like Mataji said and uh, you also agreed, yes, of course, Iskon devotees have to undergo lots of training processes. Like right now, we are also studying this Bharti Shastri courses. This is also a part of our training. So, but outside Iskon, Krishna devotees are not following all these things. Whatever they do, I think uh, they do as per their whims and fancies. That's all, Maharaj. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yes, chanting is not easy. It's a challenge for all of us. We have to understand the, the difficulties. Okay, let's go ahead here. Coming back to our PowerPoint. Okay, <laughs> so Prabhupada said, in relation to that, you know, we're talking it's easy, Prabhupada said, what is the difficulty? <laughs> so, someone can read. Although non-devotees declare that the path of bhakti or devotional service is very easy, they cannot practice it. If the path of bhakti is so easy, as the non-devotee class of men proclaim, then why do they take up the difficult path? Actually, the path of bhakti is not easy. The so-called path of bhakti practiced by unauthorized persons without knowledge of bhakti may be easy. But when it is practiced factually, according to the rules and regulations, the speculative scholars and philosophers fall away from the path. BG 7.3 PP. Thank you, Manaji. Yes. So Prabhupada's... Uh giving us a conclusion of our exercise there on Vaishnav integrity, that actually path of bhakti is not so easy. And certainly when we try to follow all the rules and regulations, it's a great challenge. How, much, how strict we can be as devotees and how much we can follow. It's not so easy. I mean, Okay, maybe that Mataji could, you know, if you have a lot of background noise, can you mute your microphone? Okay, we're going to go ahead. Kastyan mam veti tattvataha. Okay, this is still 7.3. Kastyan mam veti tattvataha, vijnana. The first six chapters of the Gita are meant for those who are interested in transcendental knowledge, in understanding the self, the super-self, and the process of realization by jnana-yoga, dhyana-yoga, and discrimination of the self from matter. However, Krishna can be known only by persons who are in Krishna consciousness. Other transcendentalists may achieve impersonal Brahman realization, for this is easier than understanding Krishna. 
right? Prabhupada is explaining impersonal Brahman realization may be easier than realizing, than understanding Krishna. This is e it's easier to understand we're not the body, we're simply souls. That's not a very difficult thing to understand, that I'm not the body, I'm a soul. I think many times, many, many, many people who have that kind of understanding, that kind of knowledge, but to find somebody who actually understands the nature of the soul and the relationship of the soul with the super soul, then that's very rare. Just having simple knowledge of the impersonal Brahman, understanding I'm the, not the body, that's, it's nice, it's, you know, they're, they're good people, we have some spiritual realization, but still, they're a long way from understanding Krishna. So, so Maharaj I have a question here on this particular line that mentions that um, Krishna can be known only by persons who are in Krishna consciousness. Uh, just want to check with you that if I think about Meera Bhai, right, who was the ardent devotee of Krishna, she was not following um, any, you know, movement or society, right? So she was on her own and a great devotee of Krishna. So what's the difference between her devotion and someone who is following everything in Krishna consciousness? Yes, there is some difference there. You know, uh, when you hear some of the bhajans of Mirabai, you'll see her mood in relating to Krishna is different from the mood of the pure devotees, like the Goswamis, how the Goswamis, how they present the mood of Krishna, approaching Krishna. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how is he presenting us to Krishna consciousness? The Goswamis, under the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they all worship Krishna in the mood of separation in the mood of service and separation. You don't see that in Mirabai. She's not presenting that mood of service and separation. She's not a follower of the gopis. She has her own individual relationship with Krishna, but she's not following in the line, as we know it from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who himself follows in the mood of the gopis because he declared the gopis to be the greatest devotees of Krishna. So there is difference there. Mirabai's mood, if you listen to her bhajans and how she sings about Krishna, you know, she's seeing Krishna and so on. But the mood of the people like Naratam Das Thakur and uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Goswamis, you know, they're all talking, they're feeling more the mood of separation from Krishna than the, the mood, the, and the mood of giving service to Krishna, submission to Krishna, and following in the mood of the gopis, Vipralamba Seva. So that's a difference. Yeah. The Mirabai is not kept connected in any parampara. She didn't come through any line of disciplic succession. She wasn't trained by any acharyas. But she had yeah. her she had her own devotion for Krishna. That was nice. Yeah. But it's it's yeah. it's not in the quite in the mood. See Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Goswamis, they're teaching about the developing this mood of the, the great longing for Krishna and the, this mood of separation from Krishna and feeling the desire, just the longing to be with Krishna. So this is the special feature of the devotion which is taught by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his devotees like Rupa Goswami and the other Goswamis. Naratam Das Thakur and so on. 
they're all in this line. You understand? Yes, yeah, sort of. Uh, yeah, sort of. But w w did she know Krishna? The way we say that only Krishna consciousness people can know Krishna. But did she know him? Well, well yes. yes she, I mean, she knew him according to her own, her in her own way, you know, hmm. not quite in the way in which we know her, we know Krishna. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead. Yes, here's a from Prabhupada's purport. Could someone help me to read this, please? It is not possible for a Brahman realized impersonalist or the Paramatma realized yogi to understand Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as the son of Mother Yashoda or the charioteer of Arjuna. Even the great demigods are sometimes confused about Krishna. Muyanti Yatsurya Mam tu Mam tu Veda na Kashchina. No one knows me as I am, the Lord says. And if one does know him, then Sa Mahatma Sudur such a great soul is very rare. Therefore, unless one practices devotional service to the Lord, one cannot know Krishna as he is. Atvata, even though one is a great scholar or a philosopher. Bhagavad Gita 7.3 perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. So here you can see some particular ways of which we understand Krishna. We, you were talking, we were hearing about Mirabai just now. So Mirabai, she has her particular image of Krishna and her relate, mood of Krish, relating to Krishna. But here in our line of Krishna consciousness, we think of Krishna as the son of Mother Yashoda or the charioteer of Arjuna. This is particularly the, the mood of devotees. In, in our line, now Mirabai, she doesn't have quite that kind of mood. You're not thinking of Krishna as the son of Mother Yasoda or the charioteer of Arjuna. She's thinking of him in a different way, in her, her own way. So we are following the line of our acharyas. And they're teaching us. We want to understand Krishna in this way. The Brahman, in Brahman realized impersonalists and the Paramatma realized yogis, they can never think like this. The, the jnanis, the Brahma jnanis, they're only thinking the oneness of Brahman. And the yogis, they just think of the, the Paramatma, the super soul, the Lord in the heart. But we are thinking of Krishna in these different ways, with Mother Yashoda, with Arjuna, the very special. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, even the demigods, they get confused about Krishna. And Krishna also knows that. His, the, the Mahatmas are not very common. So it's, it doesn't help you just being a great scholar or philosopher. What's important is devotion. And devotion is cultivated by association with devotees. In the association of devotees, we hear about Krishna. We'll be hearing about Krishna. All right, so... Prabhupada explains, nobody is interested to become Brahmana. They are interested to become dogs and hawks. That is their interest. Manushyanam sahasreshu kaschidjatati sadaye. And yatadamapi sidanam. It is not that coming to the platform of a qualified Brahmana, one can understand Krishna. That is also not complete. Still you have to go further. 
So Brahmana is just the mode of goodness. To actually understand Krishna, we have to come to the level Shuddha Sattva, pure goodness. We have to transcend the three modes, right? We have to go on from there. So Prabhupada is quoting the 7.3, this Yatatam Apisiddhanam, hardly one knows me in truth. Some people may understand the Brahman, that's not full, that's only part. All right, so we show here, moving on, from 7.3, we're going up verse number 4 and number 5. Verse number 4 describes the inferior energy, the paraprakriti, the elements of the material nature, the Mahabhutis, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence and false ego. Altogether, these eight comprise my separated material energies, right? These are the eight elements of the material nature, the inferior or apara prakriti, inferior prakriti. And uh, it's described as Krishna's separated energies, right? Does anybody, someone can explain to me why it's separated? Yes, anyone? Uh, uh, Manaj, maybe because this has, uh, all of these have uh, no consciousness. Um, yeah. Yes, that's certainly true. That's the difference between the, the para and the apara prakriti. We have the inferior prakriti, it's inanimate, it doesn't have consciousness. But the para prakriti is superior, it does have consciousness. But what is it... Yeah. Yes? Manch, uh, is this because Krishna does not interact with this energy directly? Yes, right. That's right. Krishna doesn't directly involve himself with the material energy. Prabhupada gives an example, he said, just like in the material world, a man may have a wife, but they may be separated. You know, maybe they don't get along well together and they just decide to separate, you know, they don't keep a close connection with each other. So the relation is not so intimate. So Krishna's relationship with the material energy is like that. On another occasion, Prabhupada gave a different example. He said, just like, I uh, said, uh, the milk of the cow. Prabhupada said, the milk of the cow is the separated energy of the cow. <laughs> and then he, another time, recorded lecture. The recorded le lecture, in, in Prabhupada's time, you know, it was real to real tape recorders. And, but Prabhupada said that this recording, this is my separated energy. <laughs> so Prabhupada gave us different examples to understand this separated material energy. Alright, so the apara prakriti is inanimate, no consciousness, but the para prakriti is superior, has consciousness, right? Apariyam itastvanyam prakriti vidime param. Jiva Buddha Mahabaho Yedam Daryate Jagat, right? We do have a problem. Although we are superior energy, we are exploiting the resources of this material nature. This is our defect. Hmm? Jiva Bhutta Mahabaho Yeyedam Daryate Jagat. Yeyedam Daryate Jagat. We thinking this material nature is for our enjoyment. We're taking it for ourselves. We're not recognizing who is actually the proprietor. We are thinking we are the master. In actual fact, we are the servant. We are Prakriti. 
We may be para prakriti, but we're still prakriti. We're not the purush. Krishna is the purush. But we're thinking we're the purush. So this is the problem. Maharaj, uh, can I ask a question, please? Yes, please do. Yes. Maharaj, many times uh, Sri Prabhupada would often mention that when this material energy, when we connect it to Krishna, it becomes spiritualized. Uh, like some of these material elements, like a mic, microphone or something. This is how he gives examples, they become spiritualized. So, uh, so what does it technically mean that they become spiritualized, uh, knowing that this is a separated material energy? So what does it mean that it becomes spiritualized? It means that we're using it in the service of Krishna. It's connected to Krishna's service. So in that sense, it's become spiritualized. Simply, simply that. The spiritual connection is made by the utility of the object in Krishna's service. So it does not that it becomes some sort of part of the internal potency of the Lord when, when that object is being used for uh, Krishna's service? Does it become part of the internal potency? Well, <laughs> you know, it, it remains still the, uh, it's still in the material world and it's not going to go back to Godhead, right? It's here in the material world, but we're utilizing it for the higher purpose, for the service of Krishna. So in that sense, it's becoming spiritualized. Can we say it's part of the internal potency of Krishna? Mm. <laughs> uh, temporarily, so long as you use it in the service of Krishna, yes. If you always use it in the service of Krishna, then it's the internal potency. But <laughs> if you use it for some other thing, then, you know, just like we ourselves, we are jivas. You know, we, are, we can also be part of the internal potency, but we can also fall back into the material world. So our, our position is not, not going to be a hundred percent. Not that we are fully under the influence of the internal potency. Maharaj, thank you so much. Uh, Maharaj, I have a question. Yes. So, um, uh, can, okay, can we go back to the slide? I'm not able to see. Okay. Okay. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, false ego, all together, these constitute separated materialness. Okay. So, um, what I understood is that because Krishna doesn't deal with them directly, so they are called separated. Um, Krishna does not deal with them directly. What what does this actually mean? Because uh, if Krishna, uh, like when he descended or when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu descended, he, he dealt with uh, Yamuna water. He dealt with uh, other things also. So, so what is the meaning of they, Krishna doesn't deal with uh, earth, water, directly. I didn't understand that. Well, it's a, it's a material energy, right? It's inferior. It's in here in the material world. It's not under his internal potency. These elements of the material, material world, they're created and annihilated again and again. Sometimes they're manifest, sometimes they're not. It's the nature of the material elements. They're eternal, but sometimes they manifest, sometimes they're not. At the end okay. of the life of Brahma, it's all annihilated again. Hmm? And enters into Mahavishnu, and then there's again creation, and it's all created. So, this is the material world. Krishna is not really enjoying this material world. He doesn't come... You know, he comes to this world, and he just performs some pastimes here. But when he comes, he will bring with him his own abode. He will bring with him the Vrindavan Dham, 
and he will bring the Govardhan Hill and like that, you know, and he will bring also Srimati Radharani. <laughs> so he brings the internal potency here into this world. But the material world is not really a place. It, it's described temporary place of misery. So Krishna doesn't take much pleasure here. He doesn't take pleasure in the material world. He gets his pleasure in the spiritual world in the, with his eternal devotees. Yeah? Hare Krishna. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, we'll go ahead. Krishna's material and spiritual energy, the science of God. Okay, here's Krishna. Here's the Apara Prakriti. No consciousness. Right? And up here we have the Para Prakriti living entities, conscious by nature, qualitatively equal to the Lord. That's the living entities. The inferior energy, no consciousness, just material ingredients. And there's a connection. Paraprakriti and the Aparaprakriti. They, they, you know, we need to take a body. We come to this material world. We need a body. So under the direction of Krishna, the living entities, the para-prakriti, they accept a body made up of the apara-prakriti. And then the spirit soul needs to have a material body because we have material desires. So under the direction of Krishna, we take on material bodies. Bina prakriti, separated energy. So here's from Prabhupada's explanation from a lecture in New Vrindavan. Someone read for us. Bina means separated. An example is when I speak into the tape recorder, when you replay the tape recorder, you hear my voice. But it is not me, it is my separated energy. With my energy, I have spoken. I have vibrated some sound and it is recording on the tape. When it is played back, it produces exactly the same sound, but it is separated from me. Try to understand. This material world is just like that. Vinna, separate. Real life is in the spiritual world. And these energies, the external energy, Krishna says, are separated. Separated means you cannot perceive Krishna directly from this energy. Bhagavad Gita 7.4, New Vrindavan, 1974. All right. We cannot perceive Krishna directly from this energy. Okay, no, knowledge of the Absolute, energies of Krishna. Oh, this is not a very important point. We can read it quickly. Someone read. The first five gross elements plus their sense objects, earth, fragrance, water, taste, fire, form, air, touch, and ether sound, add up to ten elements. Mind, intelligence, and false ego bring the total to thirteen. The false ego is the cause of five knowledge acquiring senses and the five working senses. That equals 23 elements. Finally, we add the Mahatattva, Mahatattva, the 24th element, which is the cause of false ego. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaji. Yes. So this is from Surrender Unto Me by Barijan Prabhu, describing how the elements of material creation number 24. Right? Initially we had eight elements, now it's become 24. More detail. Krishna is addressed as Mahabaho, Bhagavad Gita 7.4, yes, Krishna. Why is Arjuna addressed as Ma Mahabaho? Please read. Arjuna, Arjuna, is is Maha. <laughs> Arjuna is addressed as Mahabaho, the great warrior, 
can you understand what is meant by great warrior whoever is acting under krishna's direction is a great warrior just as arjuna is fighting this battle so when you take shelter of krishna and fight against material opposing elements shudras you are also mahabaho you are fighting with persons who are not krishna conscious you are pushing on the krishna consciousness movement by fighting but this fighting is different this was taught by lord chaitanya mahaprabhu krishna varnam tusha krishnam sangopasa sangopanga sastra prashadam lecture bhagavad gita 7.45 Yes, that's Prabhupada lecturing in Bombay, 1971. He's encouraging the devotees. They had to fight there, you remember? Prabhupada bought the land and at one point the devotees all got locked up and arrested and they tried to break the temple. Well, it was a real battle. And so Prabhupada's encouraging the devotees there. This fighting is different. This was taught by Lord Chaitanya. You're pushing on Krishna consciousness movement by fighting. So we have to also become great warriors. We do have to fight. We have to push on Krishna consciousness despite all the elements, despite all the opposition. We have to push on regardless. Going on, verse number 6 of the seventh chapter. Krishna is the creator. Lord is the cause of the world by these two energies, Maya Sati and Jiva Shakti, Shitra and Shitragna. Hmm. Right? So 7.4, we heard about the Prakriti, the different elements of Prakriti, the inferior Prakriti. Then 7.5 was describing the superior Prakriti or the Jiva. Now, seven verses number six and seven are going to describe about Lord Krishna, who is the Ishwara. So you can see the Prakriti, Jiva, Ishwara, that interaction between these things. So you have the Jiva Shakti and the Maya Shakti, right? Shetra, Shetra is a, the field, or the Maya Shakti, and Shetragna is the living entity. And there are two living, two Shetragnas, the Paramatma is also the, the Shetragna. He is the cause of creation, maintenance and destruction. The soul of all souls. Oh, wonderful verse, number seven, right? This is a very nice verse. I hope you all know it very well. You should be from uh, uh, can I ask a question regarding the last verse? Okay, Prabhu, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Maharaj, it is mentioned uh, then Shetra and Shetragya. So, why um, uh, why is Shetra and Shetragya these technical words are used? Because it is uh, like uh, Krishna could have easily uh, Prakriti or Jeev. Uh, what is the technical uh, mean import of these two words? Well, Shetra is, I said, field, right? And Shetragna is the knower of the field. And so she, the body is like a field. And just like a, you have a piece of land, you have a field. And so you plant things in it, you do work with the field, you cultivate the land and you produce something. Or somebody, some people, they may have land, they may not cultivate it, they just let the weeds grow. And so it's, the body is like that. It depends how we use it. It's like a field. You can use the body to become self-realized or you can use the body to just eat and sleep. So it's a, and, and, but of course you get reactions depending on what you plant. If you plant melons, you will harvest melons. If you plant beans, you will harvest beans. You can't think, oh, I'll, I'll plant beans and grow rice. You won't. You get the results. Jaisa Karaga, Aisa Paraga, right? You say in Hindi, you say like that. You get the results. And so the field, the body is like a field. And it depends how we use it. And the, the knower of the field is there. The living entity, the super soul also. There are two shaitras. You 
These these two terms yes, are, yes. these two terms are used in the thirteenth chapter in the Bhagavad Gita. You can refer chapter thirteen verses one and two. They explain there because Lord Krishna will also use Shitra and Shitrakna there in chapter thirteen of Bhagavad Gita. And he talks there about the field. Prabhupada also talked about the field planting the seeds and you know how you use the field you get that you're going to get the appropriate results depends how you use the field so how you use the body will depend are you going to go to hell are you going to go to heaven or are you going to get liberation and be a devotee well, it depends on us how we use this body yeah yeah yes okay, okay. So Krishna is the soul of all souls. Number seven, very nice verse, very important verse. Mataparataram nanyat kinchid asti dananjaya mai sarvam idam proktam sutre mani gana eva. This this is a very important verse. Note here that Lord Krishna is saying there is no truth superior to me. Now. We can point out that nobody else says that. Lord Shiva never says, there is no truth superior to me. And neither does Mother Durga, neither does Ganesh, none of the devas ever say, there is no truth superior to me. Only Krishna says like this, there is no truth superior to me. Everything rests on me. And Krishna gives this beautiful example. Everything rests on him just like the pearls are on a thread. And you can see in the picture there, the deity is wearing beautiful beads around the neck. You see the beads, we don't see the thread. And so it's like that. Everything is resting on Krishna, but we don't see Krishna. Just as we don't see the thread which is supporting all the pearls. So the example is very appropriate. And Krishna conceals himself. Krishna doesn't reveal himself to everyone. But he's making a very powerful, very strong statement here that there is no truth superior to him. And Prabhupada explains, absolute truth is a person. There is a common controversy over whether the Supreme Absolute Truth is personal or impersonal. As far as Bhagavad Gita is concerned, the Absolute Truth is the Personality of Godhead Sri Krishna. And this is confirmed in every step. In this verse in particular, it is stressed that the Absolute Truth is a person. Right? Krishna is speaking and he's saying, I am the highest truth. There is no truth superior to me. So, obviously, the absolute truth must be a person. If we take this statement as truthful, as being fact, then the absolute truth is a person. Any comments and questions on this? Maharaj, I'm not clear about uh, why Shri Prabhupada is saying that uh, because it says that he's a supreme absolute truth, so he's a person. Uh, so how is he connecting the two? Because Krishna, uh, exact. Because Krishna exactly. spoke this verse, Lord Krishna spoke this verse, and he said that he is the highest truth. He said, I am the absolute truth. Now Krishna is a person. We have to accept that Krishna is speaking, it's, a per it's not a voice in the clouds which is speaking, it's Krish Lord Krishna himself is there on the battlefield of Kurukshetra with Arjuna, in front of Arjuna and he's telling Arjuna, I am the highest truth, I am the absolute truth, there is no truth above me. So it must be personal, Krishna is a person. You, you can't say Krishna is not a person. Huh? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Thank but, you. But, but Maharaj, some impersonalists do also say that Krishna's body and Krishna's soul is different. 
so uh, they can understand this uh, in a different sense they they understand this in the sense that uh, krishna's soul is uh, what what we say uh, the highest truth yeah but krishna doesn't say that you see this is their speculation mm -hmm. they put words into the mouth of krishna they they come up with this non these nonsense propositions nonsense proposals they're not accepting the words of lord krishna as he's speaking prabhupada calls his gita as it is but they want to change everything they want to make everything the way they want it they don't follow the, the teachings of krishna we don't we we can't we can't follow we can't we cannot and we cannot endorse anything these people are saying because it's all speculated it has nothing in the scriptures to support their teach their their words and so we're we're following lord krishna as he spoke what's his message if krishna wanted to say that he would have said that himself he would have made it very clear we don't find that there this is their own speculation. Yeah. That is why yes. the seventh chapter began. Here, we have to hear from the right person. If you hear from the wrong person, then you, you get problems. You'll be doomed. You have to hear from the devotees. You have to hear through the parampara. Otherwise, so many problems. So many speculations, so many nonsense ideas, and you get nowhere. All right, we'll go ahead. All right, next section of Bhagavad Gita, text 8 to 12. Krishna is the maintainer of the universe. Yes, someone read? O son, of Kunti. o son of Kunti, I am the taste of water, the light of sun and the moon, the syllable Om in the Vedic mantras, I am the sound in ether and ability in man. All right, yeah. Lord Krishna is taking basic elements of the material world, water, one of the elements, the sun and the moon, the main planet, then you have ether also. So we have water, ether. Go ahead, Manaji. This verse explains how the Lord is all pervasive by His diverse material and spiritual energy. The Supreme Lord can be preliminary perceived by His different energies, and this way He is realized impersonally. Okay, that was. We should understand these things. Prabhupada is explaining to us how to perceive Krishna indirectly. Hmm? He has realized this is impersonal. In the, he has realized impersonally by his different energies. The, the taste of water, the light of the sun, all of these things, these are Krishna's energies. And we could say, this is Krishna. Sometimes when people would say, have you seen God? Prabhupada say, who has not seen the light of the sun and the moon? Everyone has seen. That is Krishna. So, we can see Krishna in this way, by his different energies. But of course, this is his impersonal feature. This is not Krishna directly, but impersonally we see Krishna through his energies. Uh, uh, Maharaj, I have a question here. Yes. So, in uh, a few verses back, uh, Krishna uh, mentioned his separated energies, wherein we discussed uh, we cannot perceive Krishna directly. Uh, in, indirectly, we can say that, okay, these are Krishna's energies. And, and almost similar thing is mentioned here, but, but here it is more specific. I'm the taste of water. Uh, in that verse, it was mentioned that 
only water is a separate energy but now he is very specifically saying a taste of water uh, he is not saying a uh, taste of other things um so how should i understand this well before we were hearing just simply water we didn't hear about the taste of water we simply heard water the elements earth water fire air ether but here krishna says the taste of water is a particular feature of the water which is significant right you, we want to understand how krishna is we want to understand how lord krishna is present there it's it's that feature of taste which represents krishna so basically the elements and any feature which the elements have yeah well he mentions also the sound in ether not just simply ether but sound in ether hmm so these these are, these are actually we'll see in chapter 10 these are like vibhutis of krishna these are these are actually uh, it, you know, uh the expansions of krishna how krishna comes in this material world in these particular ways oh. so a devotee devotee can actually see krishna and well actually arjuna asked krishna how can the common man in chapter 10 arjuna was asking krishna how can a common man perceive you through the material world and that led to krishna speaking about vibhuti yoga and he described many different things similar to here he spoke about for example uh, of bees i am the lion of aquatics i'm the shark of of rivers i'm the ganga of immovable things i'm the himalayas like this so many features of the material world so here also lord krishna is describing how we can see him through his different energies but again this is his impersonal feature All right. Okay. So it this goes on to verse 12. Right? Someone like to read for us this statement? So even you you are not inclined to chant Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, then try to understand Krishna in this way. This is the process given by Sri Krishna himself. Rasoham apsu kanteya. You have to drink water. You cannot avoid it. so when you taste while drinking water anything drinking apsu apsu means a liquid thing either you drink milk or even up to you drink wine you so you have got some taste in any liquid thing while drinking so krishna says rasoham apsu kontaya my dear kontaya arjuna that taste in the liquid thing which you drink or use that i am just see how easily it can be done nothing is without drinking something liquid either coca cola or water or this or that we have all to drink something so krishna says that i am the taste so where is the difficulty to understanding krishna bhagavad gita 7.8 bombay prabhu chapter 23 974 thank you thank you madhuri yes Yes, Prabhupada is stressing this point that I am the taste. Krishna says I am the taste, not just I am water, but I am the taste. <laughs> right? Uh, there, actually, Prabhupada was in Indonesia, in Jakarta, and uh, there was one man there, and he was telling Prabhupada. He said, "Swami Ji," he said, "You know, I like Krishna very much, but I also like wine. I like to drink alcohol." So Prabhupada was telling him like that, you know. He said, "You should think that that taste, that that is Krishna." <laughs> Prabhupada was telling him. He said, "When you drink, you just think that that taste, that is Krishna." Okay. <laughs> 
Maharaj, uh, just one quick question. Yes. Uh, so since these all these things uh, pertain to the impersonal aspect of realizing Krishna, I'm just wondering what are what is the relevance of these verses for practicing bhakti yogis? So practicing devotees, what is the relevance of these verses? How should we perceive these verses? Well, we can we also can see Krishna in the material world. It's helpful for us also. It's not that we can always see Krishna in his three or four bending form. You know, we cannot always just be thinking of we're not so advanced that we can just be thinking of Krishna in his form of Shamsunda. So we can also see, learn to see Krishna through these different features of the material world. The, the different ways in which, and we sometimes in our own preaching and presenting to other people, we may, you may be able to remember Krishna Shamsunda in a threefold bending form, playing on the flute with the lotus eyes and head bedecked with peacock feathers. But not everyone can do that. And for ordinary people, they need to hear these things. They need to hear how Krishna is present through his different energies. Thank you so much. Practically, uh, it becomes... <laughs> It becomes sometimes very difficult. Sometimes the water is uh, salty. So, so that time we, we don't remember uh, Krishna there. We say, oh, this is, what is this? Yes, but oh, that, oh, oh. that's something in the salt, right? It's The water itself is salt, has its taste, but this, you're tasting the salt. Now you have to take the salt out from the water, then you can actually taste the water. Yeah, salty water is not very pleasant, but the water itself is still pleasant, it's just polluted with the salt. So we have to have desalinated water. All right, we're going to speak a, a little more yes, here about this integrity, Vaishnava integrity. The jurisdiction of Krishna consciousness extends everywhere, and one who knows Krishna consciousness is blessed. Krishna is everywhere, Krishna is everywhere in everything. Everything rests on him, like the pearls are strung on a thread. Nobody sees the thread, we don't see Krishna, but Krishna is everywhere. So we want to develop that kind of vision. We say Vaishnava integrity is meant to equip, equip students with the ability to see through the eyes of Shastra and with a Krishna conscious world view, ultimately to assist the students in realizing scripture and in seeing Krishna at all times and in all places. And so you know, when we read the, these verses in the Bhagavad Gita, it should help us to actually see Krishna. We may say, oh, we're bhaktas, we're doing bhakti yoga, this is impersonal, but it's all part of Krishna. Krishna, we say, brahmeti paramadmeti bhagavan iti shabyate. It's all part of the absolute truth. Brahman, paramatma and bhagavan. So it's all pleasing to the devotee. The devotee sees the impersonal feature, they also immediately can relate it to Krishna. The presence of Krishna can be perceived everywhere through his para-spiritual and apara-material energies. What prevents us from seeing, knowing, and surrendering to Him. <laughs> right? What prevents us from seeing, knowing and surrendering to Krishna? Any answers? Krishna is everywhere. Not... Why are you not seeing and knowing and surrendering? Yes, Manaji? Why is nothing? 
nothing nothing except our mind nothing what do you mean you mean? nothing can, nothing can stop me seeing krishna knowing krishna is rendered to krishna maharaj nothing stops you from seeing krishna yes so you're seeing krishna all the time uh, uh, maharaj as we are reading like light is krishna water is the taste of water is krishna sham sundar is there mm-hmm. so what about when you're not reading the bhagavad gita though are you seeing krishna then yes maharaj as uh, we are reading that light we are using whole day we are using light so that's krishna water is krishna every human human being is there in the parmatma form so you're always, the, you're always krishna conscious no maharaj but uh, like uh, so what stops you from being krishna conscious maharaj should i say something yes maharaj these are our anarthas actually unless and until anarth nivritti is there one cannot uh, perceive krishna consciousness always yeah right yeah we have a lot of anarthas in our heart material attachments material desires and they stop us from seeing and knowing and surrendering to krishna very true prabhu thank you prabhu very nice why people why people don't know the supreme lord right someone read the verse 713 go ahead tribir gunmani mair bhave e vir sarvam idam jagat mohitam na bijanati mame vya param avyayam diluted diluted by the three modes goodness passion and ignorance the whole world does not know me who am above the modes and inexhaustible right above the, this is the, this is why we don't know krishna we are deluded by the three modes that's the problem of course prabhu said anathas we could say also the three modes we're deluded by these three modes and that's why we don't know krishna because krishna's above the modes we're under the modes so this is a problem this is why we don't know krishna one covered by illusory energy does not know him yes someone read one covered by illusory energy does not know him by the spell of this illusory energy we consider ourselves in terms of this bodily conception of life and we thus think that we are american indian russian or brahman hindu muslim etc and if we become entangled with the modes of material nature then we forget the supreme personality of godhead who is behind all these modes mm, right the bodily concept of life right so this is the maya we're in this bodily conception because of the influence of the modes of nature we forget krishna yes one cup com- oh krishna consciousness is transcendental to all these three modes of material nature and those who are truly established in krishna consciousness are actually liberated if we're actually krishna conscious then we're liberated liberated means above the modes free from the modes so we want to come to that level we want to get free of passion and ignorance and we want to even get free of the mode of goodness and come up to that level pure goodness we said the brahmana he's also material he's in the mode of goodness he's on the material platform we want to transcend that we want to become vaishnav shuddha sattva come to pure goodness that is actually liberating an exercise for you 
Make a list of things stopping us from seeing Krishna. Discuss with your partner how you can overcome these things. All right? Not a very difficult exercise, very simple. Give you five minutes. Right? Pairs. Can you make pairs, Prabhu? Uh, yes, Maharaj, I'm just making now. Make a list. I'm sure you've got a big list. I have a big list. I know you must have a big list. What would Should I open it now, Maharaj? Yes. Hare Krishna. Do I get a partner? Hare Krishna. Recording in progress. Yagna? Yes, Maharaj? You, <laughs> you put me in a room, but there was nobody there. <laughs> I was on, I was on yes, my own. Actually, uh, there was one devotee with you, so I shifted him to the another room. So you were alone there. So I just uh, moved yeah. you to the... Yeah, I was on my own. <laughs> uh, but Maharaj, you are the co-host and then you can join any, any of the room you want. Okay. Basically, we are thinking about insecurities, how we are discussing that we can depend on God. So, it's like the power of God, that I will do the best as possible. And it can't be like that, that there is no need to be done. We can achieve something in a material way, as well as in the temple. I don't agree with you over this point, health challenges. All the points are okay, but health challenges are not in our hands. I think so. Yes, uh, but so, somewhere in our hand also, like you say, we are uh, lacking, um, taking off prasadam, lack karthasme, or proper um, diet of following karana. Somewhere in, a, in our hand also. In, in that way, we say, Hosakta, the Chalde Rata, the five times. <laughs> because whatever the life gives us in the form of health, so it's not in our hands, right? But right now you are facing some problems with health. So that you had not invited, I think. So it has just come to you. So similarly, problems may arise anywhere, anytime, any day. So health issues are not... Of course, that we should take care in our diets and in our daily routine. Of course, uh, and uh, whatever uh, what I have to say uh, in the form of a list uh, that stops me to see Krishna everywhere, I think uh, my laziness, first of all, my laziness is the greatest impediment in the progress on the path of devotional service. 
Guru Maharaj okay. always uh, alerts us against this great impediment. Uh, in laziness, besides laziness, then uh, I have uh, lack of. Yes, is a major part of us. If we are in an ignorance, we can do later on. Do we are later on do? Yes, so that's a major apart part. Apart from of laziness, it. apart from laziness, I would say that uh, uh, lack of uh, attitude, proper attitude. I think uh, if I if we don't have proper attitude towards chanting, towards hearing Shrimad Bhagavatam, then also we cannot see Krishna easily. Because Shramanam, uh, Kirtanam, Smaranam, these are the first three uh, initial uh, steps to see, to progress on the path of devotional service and to realize Krishna is in. So, lack of proper attitude, interest. I think so. We are not in the, uh, sometimes we can hear na, in the lectures, ki, we are in the bagging uh, bhava. So, we are always uh, here like we have a no uh, all, all, already. But we can hear just for a uh, information on this. Not in the spiritual growth way. We have attitude just like we are uh, taking the knowledge only. Not for a applying stage as well. On this model. Considering always uh, ourselves as superior to everyone yes, else. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this is not great. Recording in progress. Okay, Yagna. Uh, shall I close the rooms, Maharaj? Yes, yes close the rooms. Back now, Maharaj. Okay. So everyone's back. Yeah, anybody like to share with us about what you discussed? Yeah. Yes, Maharaj Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, I would like to say that uh, in my life, uh, my laziness is the greatest impediment in realizing Krishna everywhere, every time. Apart from laziness, uh, Lack of proper attitude towards Shravanam, Kirtanam and Smaranam also are the obstacles of the path of devotional service. And because of these things, I am not able to realize Krishna everywhere, every time, daisy. You're very, you, you're very honest. Honest is a good quality. <laughs> Honesty is a good quality. Yeah, I, I think that <laughs> it's just, I also feel like that myself. I also think, you know, I should do, be doing much more and I'm lazy, I must be lazy, it, it, it's a problem, especially as you get older you become more lazy, you know, I should become more active but I become more lazy. <laughs> it, it, Thank you very much. But what's the solution for that? How you go, what, you know, we know we have this problem, what are we supposed to do about it? How are you going to do uh, Maharaj, I think, uh, uh, Proper prayers to the Lord every time, asking for the mercy of the, not only the Lord, but also of the Bhattas, Vaishnavas, and uh, doing the Sevas. I think these are the solutions uh, to overcome all these impediments. <clears throat> yeah, anybody can give any other solutions to laziness, what we can do to avoid laziness? Maharaj, like, uh, associate with devotees who are enthusiastic. Yes, that's one solution. If you're fortunate, if you can get that, so it's not always possible. Well, I think I think uh, you know personal resolution and determination is also very important in this case. I mean, uh, I sometime till sometime back also, you know, I used to wake up a little late in the morning and everything, but suddenly I realized that I need to check and correct my time however I need to. So I did, I, I'm trying, I am not saying I've done it, but I am at least trying because I want to correct that. So I think personal determination also matters a lot here. 
I'm, I'm sorry, Manaji, it's not clear. Taking vows. Taking vows, oh. Uh -huh. uh, Maharaj, we can change our mood. Yeah, we can set as a mood if we are going in, in a directions. Yeah, we, we want to... We want to think how to over... You know, you, we, we could take a vow but that you have to be very serious again about it. You make it just like people take vows when we give initiation. We say everybody takes vows at the time of diksha. Doesn't mean they keep the vows, you know. <laughs> Everyone's gone about, they take the vows, 16 rounds, 4 principles. Doesn't always happen, you know. People have difficulties. It's not so easy. You make vows and somehow, somehow we can't keep them. Maharaj, Maharaji, finally we are on the helpless. We can just pray to the Lord, to the Guru and uh, Vaishnavas just to have their mercy over us. And uh, we should not stop our efforts at, at least uh, to move on the path. Okay. <laughs> yes, Maharaji wanted to say something? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, I was saying that... Uh, I heard from my uh, temple president that always keep the main thing always main. What is the main thing in, in the life is to uh, get, is to uh, have Krishna Prema. So if we, our goal is fixed, then Utsaha Nisha Dharyat will automatically will be there. Always keep the main thing always main. So laziness will go, all the anarthas sooner and later will go if we keep this main thing the goal is in our mind, then laziness will not uh, be an you know, obstacle. Okay. I just wonder how I could keep that in my mind all the time. <laughs> the, the, the goal is Krishna Prem. Yeah, we know that, we quote that, Prem Punato Mahan, but to keep that in my mind and to act on that all the time, that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, anybody else? Okay, we'll go ahead. Certainly, there's always things stopping us from seeing Krishna. It could be, I heard some one devotee was saying health problems. It could be, you know, well, family problems, economic problems. No, oh, so many problems. There's always problems. But somehow or other, we have to overcome them. So as Madhiji just said, <laughs> keep the mind on the goal, Krishna Prem. Remember the goal, finally, we want to get that Krishna Prem. We have to get over all these obstacles, right? Get, remove all, Prabhupada said, with one kick of my foot, I can get rid of all these obstacles. One devotee wrote to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I have so many obstacles. Prabhupada said, one kick of my foot, I'll move all these obstacles. So just remember that. Prabhupada's foot will remove all the obstacles. Just take shelter of Prabhupada and he will bring us to see Krishna. Okay, we'll go ahead here. 7.14. Oh, a great verse, right? Everyone knows this one? Who's like, who would like to read? Yes. Yes. Read. This divine energy of mind, consisting of consisting of the three modes of material nature, is difficult to overcome. But those who have surrendered unto me can easily cross beyond it. Yes, right. Who can know Krishna? Who can know Krishna? Those who have surrendered to Krishna, they can know Krishna. Those who have crossed over the material nature, they know Krishna. Why does he say Maya, the divine energy? Devi, Esha, Guna, Mayi. 
Why does he say Maya, the divine energy? Anyone? Maya is Kanata. Yes. Maya, which is not. So you Maharaj, uh, yes. Maya, Maya is defined as divine energy because it belongs to Krishna. Since Krishna is divine, that, that's why even the energy is also divine. And it's her duty to keep uh, the conditioned source within material world. Right, yeah, material energies. That's her task, right, to keep us in here. It's uh, the prison house. It's always difficult to get out of the prison. So we're in the prison house of the material world. Right? Read someone? Inferior material nature is defined herein as divine nature due to its divine connection and movement by the divine will. Being conducted by the divine will, material nature, although inferior, acts so wonderfully in the construction and destruction of the cosmic manifestation. 7.4. Mm, right. Isn't it so wonderful, the material nature? Although it's inferior, it's so wonderful, right? So many things bewilder us. The latest car, the, the, the night lights. Oh, the, we're so easily bewildered by the material energy. Yes, what is this? Mama Maya Duratnya. Why is it so difficult to overcome? Because both the material and spiritual natures, emanations from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, are eternal. Hmm. We may think, oh, it's material. It's, yes, it's material, but it, it's eternal. Sometimes it's manifest, sometimes it's not, but it's eternal. Eternally conditioned souls, nitya vada. Someone read. Both the material and spiritual natures, being eman emanations from the supreme personality of God, at are eternal. The living entities belong to the eternal superior nature of the Lord, but due to the contamination by the inferior nature, matter, their illusion is also et eternal. The conditioned soul is therefore called Nitya Baddha or eternally conditioned. No one can trace out the history of his becoming conditioned at a certain date in material history. Bhagavad Gita 7.4 perfect. Mm -hmm. So, we're eternally conditioned. Does it mean we have to stay eternally conditioned? Manaji? Yes, Mataji, we're eternally conditioned. Does it mean we're going to stay eternally conditioned? No, Maharaj, by the blessings. Yes, by whose blessings? By the blessing of senior Vaishnavas Guru and how, Krishna. How do we get free of this conditioning? How do, how do we become Nitya Mukta? Just by engaging in, this, uh, in the pure devotional service, uh, by following the footsteps of previous Acharyas and under the directions of Guru. So by Sadhana Bhakti. Maharaj, yes, by, by Vedi Sadhana Bhakti, like by, when we follow the rules and regulations, then we can go to the level of Raghavuga Bhakti, like by spontaneous attraction to Lord. Yes. Okay, we're not going to talk about Raganuga Bhakti yet. Don't bring that in. But we want to come from Nitya Bhada to Nitya Mukta. How, how can we do it? By following the rules and regulations. Yes, the different processes. Uh, that is called sadhana, right? Sadhana Siddha. By sadhana Siddha we can become Nitya Mukta. Any other way? 
Maharaj Kripa said? By, yes, mercy. By what? Mercy, right. Kripa Siddha, yes. By Kripa Siddha. Is it very common to get mercy? No, Maharaj. No, Maharaj. Yeah, Prabhupada said, like honorary degree. Honorary degree. You know, Rabindranath Tagore, he got an honorary degree from Oxford University. They called him, come, we're going to give you a degree. He didn't go there, he didn't study, he didn't get admitted, he didn't take any exams, but he wrote his books and they appreciated it and they gave him honorary degree. So it's not very common, it's very rare. I didn't get honorary degree. None of you got honor. I don't think, got honorary degrees. You know, we may have studied at university, but we didn't get the honorary degree. And so that's Kripa Siddha. Prabhupada says like that. Like, is it, when devotee asked Prabhupada, what does it mean, Kripa Siddha? He said, just like somebody comes and they put a million dollars in your hand. You never saw them before. They just walk up to you and say, here, take it. He said, that is Kripa Siddha. Is it very common? No. Very, very, very rare. Right. And so, to get Kripa Siddha, not, you, we need to do therefore sadhana siddha. By sadhana only we can become perfect. But we also pray for the mercy. We do pray for the mercy of the Vaishnavas, that they will be merciful on us. So Nitya Bada doesn't mean we have to remain Nitya Bada. We can become liberated soul. In the scriptures it is stated the liberated soul, Ihayasya Hariadashye Karmana Manasagira Nikilas Papiyavastastu Jivan Mukta Sauchati. One who uses the body, mind and words in the service of Krishna, then he is a liberated soul in this life. Right? In this very life you can become Nitya, nitya Mukta, Jivan Mukta, Jivan Mukta Sauchati. You just simply use that body, mind and words in the service of Krishna. Alright, question. What is the illusory curtain that separates us from Krishna? Who knows? Yes. What is the curtain separating us from Krishna? Um, the time this uh, body. Yeah, like that. Yeah. So, so One word. Maya. Right. How to overcome it? How to overcome this Maya? Take the shelter, shelter of shelter. Guru and uh, Gauranga. Yeah, surrender to Krishna. Shelter. Right. Surrender to Krishna. Mam eva ye prapajante mayami tam taranti te. Right. Read. Mayam eva prapajante mayam eva prapajante mayam eva taranti te. Devotion service of Krishna consciousness can help one gain such release. Krishna, being the lord of the illusory energy, can order this insurmountable energy to release the conditioned soul. He, <clears throat> he orders this release out of his causeless mercy on the surrendered soul and out of his uh, paternal affection for the living entity who is originally a beloved son of the lord. Therefore, surrender onto the lotus feet of the lord is the only means to get free from the clutches of the Stringent material nature. Bhagavad Gita 7.14 Prabhupada. Yes, right. Surrender to Krishna. Mam eva ye prapajyante mayam etam tarantite. Share with a friend a personal experience of surrendering and how Krishna reciprocated. So you can see in the picture Prabhupada's on the Jaladutta, he's praying to Krishna. All right? How did Krishna reciprocate there with Prabhupada? You remember? You heard the story? Maharaj, like the, the ship, the, the ocean was uh, very smooth. Like the captain also told that he has never seen uh, th this, uh, the ocean so calm. Yes, right. Yeah. Hmm. 
and Prabhupada was having heart attack. And what happened? He saw Krishna. Appeared in the heart. He saw Krishna rowing the boat. Prabhupada was in the boat. Krishna was rowing the boat, helping him cross the ocean. So, when we when we're in, sometimes we're in great stressing situations, and we if we just surrender, then Krishna will reciprocate. Certainly, it happens. Krishna is a person and he does care about his devotees. And if we're really trying to surrender, then Krishna will help us. Freedom is possible only by understanding Krishna. Even Lord Shiva affirms that liberation can be achieved only by the mercy of Vishnu. Lord Shiva says, Mukti Pradata Sarvesham Vishnu Eva Nasamshaya. There is no doubt that Vishnu is the deliverer of liberation for everyone. 714 purport. Okay, just to cover what we talked today. Significance of Maya Satamana in relation to Krishna's instruction on the practice of yoga. Significant. We have to fix our mind on Krishna. Very important in the practice of yoga. We must fix the mind on Krishna. That is the real business of devotee. And then the significance. Yatatamapi Siddhanam Kaschin Mamveti Tarvata in relation to Krishna's instructions on the yoga system outlined in previous chapters. We explained it. Hare Krishna. We explained how it's very difficult to know Krishna very rare. Most people come to the level of Brahman. So Krishna's instructions are there to guide us to come to Krishna consciousness, to know Him in full. So out of thousands among men, only one is endeavouring for perfection. And of those who have achieved perfection, Hardly one knows me in truth. So it's, it's rare that even people try for perfection. And it's even more rare that they know Krishna. And we have also spoken about why a conditioned soul is called Nichabada. Why is he called Nichabada? Because he's been in the material world so long that we can't remember. <laughs> so it's like eternal. Therefore, we say Nityapada, because it's so long we can't remember when it came in. End quote. Actually, the perfection of life depends on one's inclination to hear about Krishna. Unless one becomes interested in Krishna, in his pastimes and activities, there's no question of liberation by means of yoga practice or speculative knowledge. So, hearing about Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Any questions? Uh, Maharaj, yeah, Maharaj, I have a question. Yes, Anybody has any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, just regarding the Nitya Bhatta thing, I wanted to know that, uh, like, we all are Nitya Bhatta. So, does it mean that as, as and when we came into existence, from that time we are Nitya Bhattas or there is a possibility that we were uh, that, uh, we were in the spiritual world and after that sometime we become Nitya Bhatta. Generally that's what we present, that's our Krishna conscious uh, teaching. Srila Prabhupada seems to indicate that, that originally we were all Krishna conscious. 
So whether or not we were actually in the spiritual world, that is another thing, because we do understand that, you know, once you go to the spiritual world, you don't come back. <laughs> so it, it's not an easy thing to understand that. I wouldn't like to commit myself on this. I'm not going to tell you one way or the other. There's some people advocate that uh, we never leave the spiritual world, and other people say that, no, once we were, initially we were with Krishna, but somehow we fell into the material world. And so there's different opinions about this. I, I won't tell you what's right and what's wrong. There are, even within our movement, within our own society, different devotees, they have different opinions. So, so you mean, uh, if we go by Prabhupada's opinion, what Prabhupada says, it means we should, uh, you know, accept that we were there in the spiritual world and then we came in. Yes. Going by Prabhupada. It seems to be that Prabhupada said like that, yes. Thank you, Thank you but then, uh, regarding going back to Godhead, uh, like, you know, somehow God in this one, only that some people saying that when Krishna says you will never return, that means uh, until you never, uh, until the point you remain surrendered to Krishna, you will never return. But if you again uh, start, you know, don't surrender to Krishna, or you uh, disobey Krishna, then you might again have to come. So, to elaborate on this. Yes, we're marginal potency. We have that independence that any time we can fall back. So, so you mean after we go back to Godhead and if we again misuse marginal potency, there is still the possibility we can again come back to it? Well, it's possible, but it's not very likely. But, you know, it, it, it is possible because we are the marginal potency. Our nature is such that we're tatasta shakti. So we have, we can, at any time, we can, we want to leave the spiritual world, Krishna's not going to keep us. You want to go back to the material world, go ahead. That choice is always there. You don't want to stay in the spiritual world, you want to go back into Maya, go ahead. Go and enjoy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that independence is given. Okay. But, but usually people who are pure devotees who go back to Godhead, they're not going to want to come back here. It's not, you know, it's, it, it's just not going to happen. You go back to Godhead, you want to stay there. Yeah? So, 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 I mean, Regarding this thing, like Prabhupada says, 90% are good souls and 10% are bad souls. So, in those 10% fall down and those 90% never fall down. Yes, right. Majority. So, I mean, Krishna created... Huh? No. Uh, yeah, Manish, uh, sorry for uh, cutting the thing. No? What, what did you want to say? I want to say that, I mean, the Krishna create in such a manner that 90% will be good and 10% will be bad, or I mean, it, um, it, it just happened, um, what's the thing? No, just like in the material world, we see there's prisons, you know, and the, not everyone's in the prison house, you know. A small percentage of people are in the prison. So everyone has their nature. Some people are law-abiding and other people are law-rebellious. So. Everyone has their, they have that nature, they have that free will. You could think, has Krishna arranged it? No, Krishna has given everyone independence. But the nature of the living entities is such that a small portion of the living entities are rebellious. Most of the souls are obedient. So those 90% will never be, you know, coming out of those, all those 90%, they will never come into that 10% level. They will always remain obedient or... Well, mean. yes, that's right. They, they, don't, they, they, they could if they wanted, but they don't desire. They're so fully satisfied in the service of Krishna. They have no desire to leave the service of Krishna. 
Um, but then, uh, if you go by this way, that we were also at one time in the spiritual world. So it appears that one time we were also in the category of 90 percent, and then we got shifted into the category of 10 percent for now. Well, this is a difficult thing to understand. Hmm? So, generally, we, you know, the, the Acharyas say, don't try to understand how we got here. Try to understand the easiest thing, which is how to go back. Yes, Father. Mm -hmm. Yes, Father. Thank you, Father. Hare Krishna. All right, we'll stop here tonight. Then we'll be back tomorrow night. <laughs> I hope you can keep up with us here. See you tomorrow night. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gorbachev Rinda Ki Jai. Thank you, Maharaj. But before.